Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Casual Audio Readings, or Papers, I don't know, I keep jumping between the two names. Anyway, we're continuing this article, uh, Implications for Educational Practice of the Science of Learning and Development, and we're actually getting pretty close to the end here. It's a long article, but I really like these longer ones because they, they tend to be a lot more uh, broadly applicable, I suppose. They cover a lot more, too. So here we go. Supporting conceptual understanding, engagement, and motivation. Cognitive science indicates that we learn more effectively when we see how ideas are conceptually connected to one another. When our minds are fully engaged, and when, when the tasks we encounter are motivating because they are interesting and accessible, productive learning within different subjects is shaped by the unique structures of the disciplines and their particular modes of inquiry. In what follows, we discuss how teachers can shape understanding by, one, organizing and representing knowledge conceptually, two, developing an inquiry-based curriculum that integrates explicit instruction appropriately, three, designing environments and tasks that support motivation, and four, providing for interest-based learning opportunities. Organizing and representing knowledge conceptually. As we have noted, learning is enhanced when learners have a cognitive map or schema for particular concepts and relationships among concepts within a, a domain, into which they can place and connect what they are learning so that it adds up to a meaningful whole. For school-based learning, a central set of organizers are the structures of the disciplines. All subject areas have structures that reveal the ways their core ideas are connect connected with one another, including a code of patterns and regularities that organize content fields. Understanding the structure of a domain helps people learn things more effect uh, efficiently. For example, teaching vocabulary based on the underlying semantic and syntactic structure of the language enables students to learn rules for broader application. When students learn that words can be analyzed into meaningful parts, for example, the photo refers to light and hydro to water, they then may be able to figure out the meanings of words like photosynthesis and hydrotherapy. Similarly, when learning a language, knowing the structure of verb conjugations enables transfer. Cognitive scientists have found that organizing knowledge in schemas facilitates retrieval and use of material from long-term memory. More complex schemas can combine elements of less complex organizations of information that are processed into more automa automaticity, reducing the burden on, me on working memory. Organizing knowledge and automating access to this knowledge in long-term memory supports meaningful learning in complex cognitive domains. Teachers can help students understand the structure of concepts within a domain by providing an overarching conceptualization of the big ideas and then loca uh, locating specific facts or information in relation to these ideas. In a discipline like history, for example, students may consider how societies organize themselves to engage in government and commerce, and how they distribute power and manage conflicts. If students understand these core concepts, they can look at different societies and different nations over time and see patterns and discontinuities, generalizations, and connections. Each discipline also has a different manner of posing questions and solving problems. For example, scientific investigation through scientific methods, historic, historical inquiry, literary analysis, and mathematical modeling. These central modes of inquiry, knowledge finding tools, and means of using evidence are also critical to curriculum design. If students learn to use these modes of inquiry, they will be training their minds in distinctive ways, 
which was the original rationale for introducing the disciplines, and more able to engage in disciplined forms of deep learning. The structures of the disciplines, which can be used to organize the curriculum to engage students around these core ideas and modes of inquiry, have all, uh, also paved the way for transfer to other ideas, subjects, and real-life problems inside and outside of school. It is important for educators at the state, district, and school level to have knowledge of how to select high-quality curriculum materials that support a conceptual organization and understanding of the disciplines and offer thoughtful guidance for productive engagement with the materials through useful representations of ideas means to connect those ideas to students' experiences, approaches to discussions that can engage multiple approaches and explanations, and disciplinary inquiries. Many well-grounded curricular designs, including carefully researched professional learning processes to help teachers understand the underlying concepts and teaching strategies, have been supported by extensive research while this review cannot fully explore the many bodies of research on learning within the content domains, we know here that significant evidence demonstrates that effective teaching is content-specific and not based on a toolbox of generic teaching techniques. As the NRC Review of How Students Learn History, Mathematics, and Science observed, quote, Expert teachers have a deep understanding of the structure and epistemologies of their disciplines, combined with knowledge of the kinds of teaching activities that will help students come to understand the discipline for themselves." End quote. This involves particular pedagogies related to the discipline's rule of evidence for its particular modes of inquiry. Instruction helps students participate in the forms of thinking, reasoning, and doing what that and doing that, and let's go back. This involves particular instruction helps students participate in the forms of thinking, reasoning, and doing that resemble those of a skilled historian, geographer, scientist, mathematician, writer, or artist. For example, students develop a deeper understanding of history when they examine historical evidence and learn how it can be interpreted based on the type of evidence and its source and when it is placed in the context of a larger schema. Learning to look for, for and understand structures and patterns in mathematics, to reason quantitatively as a form of sense-making, and to explore multiple solution strategies produces deeper learning in mathematics. Learning to form hypotheses, experiment, observe, collect evidence, and frame conclusions while seeking to understand the principles that are at work in a phenomenon helps students begin to think scientifically. These and other disciplines have their own modes of discourse, as well as investigation strategies. Inquiry-based curriculum that appropriately integrates explicit instruction. The argument that student inquiry is critical to transferable learning is based on insights from cognitive theories about how people learn and the importance of students making sense of what they are learning and processing content deeply so that they truly understand it. Inquiry approaches to learning require students to take an active role in knowledge construction to solve a problem or probe a question. Inquiry may take place in a single day's set lesson or a long-term project centered around a question or problem that requires conjecture, investigation, and analysis using tools like research or modeling. The key is that, rather than just receiving and memorizing pieces of information, inquiry provokes active learning and student agency through questioning, consideration of possibilities and alternatives, and applications of knowledge. The family of approaches that can be described as inquiry-based includes problem-based learning, design-based learning, and project-based learning, among other, others. The success of well-designed and managed problem and, and project-based curriculum has been documented across many schools and experimental interventions. Typically, students find that students exposed, oh, typically studies find that students exposed 
to this kind of curriculum do as well as or better than their peers on traditional standardized test measures, but significantly better on measures of higher order thinking skills that transfer to new situations, as well as stronger motivation, problem solving ability, and more positive attitudes toward learning. <coughs> Similarly, meta-analyses of studies of medical students have found that those who are enrolled in problem-based curricula, in which they have to work on diagnostic inquiries regarding patients and their treatment, score higher on items that measure clinical problem-solving and actual ratings of clinical performance. Inquiry-based approaches to learning develop social and emotional skills, habits, and mindsets, as well as academic skills as students learn to set goals, plan their work, reflect on what they have learned and what more they need to know to solve a problem, overcome obstacles, and communicate what they have found. Inquiry challenges need to be carefully planned and well supported so that students in fact learn, rather than wandering aimlessly through discoveries that confuse rather than enlightening them. <coughs> Unfortunately, that's what I do often. <laughs> Research syntheses have documented the advantages of inquiry-based learning over expository forms of instruction for the transfer of learning to new contexts and have also found that the benefits for achievement are greater for students who have received useful guidance from their teachers. One meta-analysis of 72 studies found several types of guidance equally effective at promoting stronger outcomes for inquiry-based teaching as compared to ex uh, expository learning. These forms of guidance defined the learning task, provide, provided prompts, scaffolds, and ex explanations to support aspects of the task, and made task progress and learning visible to the learners. Hmm. The literature on pedagogies for inquiry indicates that effective inquiries are guided by clearly defined learning goals, well-designed scaffolds, ongoing assessment, and rich informational resources. Good inquiry tasks allow multiple methods for, research, for reaching solutions. They also allow repeated exposure to concepts and provide opportunities for feedback. An effective teacher in this approach is one who designs tasks and processes for engaging them that are clear and support understanding, and who plays an active role in making thinking visible, guiding group pr processes and participation, and asking questions to solicit reflections. The goal, excuse me, the goal is to model good reasoning strategies and support students to take on these roles themselves. Effective teachers also offer strategic feedback that takes students to the next stages of learning. Teachers provide direct instruction on critical junctures, offering explanations or directing students to resources that are crafted and timed to support inquiry. Direct instruction to provide information and develop a conceptual schema may be specifically helpful when students are new to a topic or when they have entered a new domain through an inquiry-based approach and have developed key questions that motivate them to use new information that is now con contextualized in their experience. It's actually really important. Uh, I remember when I was first uh, starting my psychological studies, um, after one class I was meant to write a research paper on a particular topic of my choosing and it was so bad. First of all, I had no idea what was an interesting question, which was actually really important to know. And, uh, well, let's just say I really needed a lot more, um, a lot more, a, a much better schema, a conceptual schema into the domain of psychology before starting to ask those sorts of questions. But it was an enlightening process, nonetheless. Students' needs for teacher support change as they become more cognitively engaged and develop expertise. 
Teachers need to gauge how much scaffolding to provide as individual learners become more knowledgeable and proficient. However, at any stage of development, learners benefit from st strategically placed direct instruction, feedback, and critical questions that guide their learning. When teachers give expl explanatory feedback rather than corrective feedback, student performance improves. In addition, instructional designers need to, need to think about learners' level of prior knowledge and expertise in order to determine what types of information and activities can facilitate learning outcomes. A common misconception is that reducing cognitive load is uniformly beneficial. However, it is the source rather than the level of the load that matters. Extraneous load, uh, such as that caused by stress or trauma, negatively affects learning. However, germane load, such that uh, such as that created when curiosity is peaked and sparks explore, exploration, increases relevant mental activities and positively affects learning. Another way of looking at that is, um, I think, how Jordan Peterson often uh, tries to get people to look at it is whether or not it is something that is foisted upon you or it is something that you uh, you choose for yourself, a, a challenge that you take on on your own. Tasks should be engaging and challenging so that germane cognitive load is as high as possible. What is helpful for an advanced learner, though, could overwhelm a novice. Knowing about the learner allows educators to design tasks and pose questions at the right level to enhance their learning. Teachers can reduce extraneous load by providing increased guidance for developing conceptual understanding during discovery learning. This can be accomplished by providing ex um, explanations of central ideas and relationships at key junctures, offering useful texts, scaffolding the tasks by sequencing them for, from less to more complex, chunking the inquiry into discrete steps with instructions and information at each step, or having students write hypotheses, conjectures, or summaries that are the basis for conceptual discussion. The amount of guidance needed will vary across developmental levels and from learner to learner. Developing metacognition, agency, and capacity for strategic learning. A critical component of learning uh, for understanding is thinking about one's prior knowledge connecting that knowledge to other ideas within a conceptual framework and processing that knowledge so that it is available for application to new contexts or problems. The process of metacognition or thinking about one's own thinking allows more strategic learning and deeper co conceptual understanding of content. Metacognition is part of a broader concept of self-regulated learning through which students are able to respond positively to feedback, set goals, and manage their progress towards these goals, which enhances their sense of agency. Metacognition is especially important as it moves students out of the role of passive receptors of information to active learners where they are aware and, uh, of and monitoring their own understanding during the learning process. In order to enable transferable learning that is increasingly independent, teaching should be designed to support metacognition so that students can learn to accomplish their goals. The use of metacognitive strategies has been found to distinguish between more and less competent learners. Strong learners can explain their learning process and articulate reasons why they decided to take certain steps or how they arrived at a particular conclusion. Shitch is an important element of engaging deeply in, learn in the learning process. Which? Yeah. Strong learners can explain their learning process and articulate reasons why they decided to take certain steps or how they arrived at a particular conclusion, which is an important element of engaging deeply in the learning process. I remember when I was first starting college and I was taking like their 
generic critical thinking class and they were talking about sources and they were like yeah if you come across a website don't really know where it's where it's from um but they have a bunch of typos probably not that great of a source but i think it's funny because a lot of people who even teach college are not very familiar with scientific papers i remember when i was a uh in English, uh, a tutor. One time I was tasked with tutoring a, a this math class. And I was just given a math paper. Now, of course, this was in like the associate's degree level of writing. But still, it was so bad. Just the way that it was written. But... It just goes to show people who are in the sciences aren't really as interested in the art of English, let's say. So it's not always about whether or not there is there's a, a minimal amount of typos. But, you know, of course, be careful about where you get your information. A substantial body of research has found that students who employ metacognitive strategies, including self-regulated learning and goal setting, are, be are better able to engage in cognitive processes, remember information, and maximize learning. We discuss here three pathways teachers can use to develop students' metacognitive skills. One, teaching metacognition and learning strategies directly. Two, providing feedback followed by practice and revision, and three, employing mastery assessment that allows students to continue to make progress in their learning that they themselves can help to guide. Teaching Metacognition and Strategic Learning As Donovan and Bransford note in How People Learn, Examples in History, Math Mathematics, and Science, learning well depends on a how prior knowledge is incorporated into building new knowledge, b, how knowledge is organized, and c, how well learners can monitor and reflect on their learning. Educators can develop metacognitive skills within the classroom through modeling of thinking, explicit strategy instruction, scaffolds for self-monitoring of thinking and actions, and regular opportunities for student self and peer assessment. Opportunities for students to reflect on their strengths and areas of growth and for students to self-correct errors can be incorporated into the curriculum within content areas so that mon monitoring of understanding is tied to domain-specific knowledge and expertise. In reading, for example, considerable work has been done to teach students to monitor their understanding in the process of reading and take steps to shore up their comprehension as needed. The, develop, uh, the development of what Pearson and colleagues call mindful management on the part of students invo involves on the part of students involves this strategic monitoring that supports comprehension, connection making, and critique. Among the many strategies that have been found effective in stimulating mindful engagement in reading are reciprocal teaching and transactional strategies instruction, which variously include strategies that ask students to think aloud as they are reading, can construct imagery, images, uh, create themes, predict, question, clarify, make connections, summarize, and read for specific lit literary elements. In other words, that's a, a lot of the stuff you do when you're teaching. <laughs> so, you know, the best learners are those who teach. In these and similar methods, teachers scaffold the process and turn over responsibility for choosing the strategies and managing the discussions to student groups as soon as possible. Reviews of experimental and quasi-experimental studies have found these strategic approaches produce positive effects for text comprehension. Duke and Pearson identified a set of steps that typically occur when teachers engage in explicit strategy instruction, including naming and describing the strategy, 
why, when, and how it should be used, modeling the strategy in action, either by teacher, student, or both, using the strategy collaboratively in a sort of group think aloud, guiding practice using the strategy with gradual release of responsibility, Finally, students using the strategy independently with no teacher guidance, either individually or in small student-led groups. These steps reinforce Baker's point that, quote, there is a sequence of development from other regulation to self-regulation. This notion provides the framework for vi virtually all instructional programs in which the goal is to enable students to take responsibility for their own learning, end quote. Instructional supports and scaffolding should, should not only be focused on higher achievement, but also on qualitative changes in the ways, quote, students view themselves in relation to the task, engage in the process of learning, and then respond to the learning activities and situation, end quote, supporting their increasing self-direction, which, in turn, increases their skills along the way. The goal... The goal is that teachers and students have a shared understanding and ownership of the learning process, and students are increasingly able to reflect on and self-monitor their own improvement. As scaffolding fades, students should internalize standards and take responsibility for their own learning. Studies have documented how the explicit teaching of metacognitive strategies can improve learning for a wide range of students across multiple subject areas. Some of, the, some of this research studies the thought processes of experts and then organizes these so that they can be taught to novices engaged in that work. Following Vygotsky's notion that talking things through, internally or aloud, helps people to learn by helping them to organize and manage their thought process, May, uh, many strategies involve teaching students to think aloud. Studies of writers have found that they engage in an internal and sometimes external dialogue about what, uh, about what they are doing and why, which helps them think through their pro writing process this research has led to strategies for teaching writing that help novice writers learn to engage in this kind of self-talk and self-monitoring. Man, my mouth is dry. Uh, help novice writers learn to engage in this kind of self-talk and self-monitoring as though uh, as they go through similar processes. A year-long study of a set of urban elementary classrooms where half of the students were identified as learning disabled found that <clears throat> when teachers of fourth and fifth grade students taught students of these approaches as they analyzed texts and modeled the writing process, students engaged in more self-regulating metacognitive strategies were more able to explain their writing process and achieved at higher levels in reading and writing than a matched group of comparison students. The learning disabled students in these classes were just as able to describe and use the writing strategies as were the regular education students in the comparison group. Sometimes the learning disabled students who had received this strategy instruction even outscored the regular education students. In a review of research on learning of argumentative writing reinforces the importance of teaching these kinds of cognitive processes to students while also engaging them in social discourse about their writing. An example from science used the metacognitive strategy of self-explanation. In one controlled experiment, for example, a group of eighth grade students used a think aloud protocol while reading about the human circulatory system from an often used biology textbook. The students read a line of text silently and were then prompted to explain to themselves out loud what the text meant. A control group, non-prompted, was asked to read the, the line of text silently twice to approximate the same amount of time dedicated to learning the material by both groups. The researchers found that self-explaining raised the, the post-test score of both high and low-achieving students, 
with those who explain the most showing the greater gains from pre to post test. Hmm. Furthermore, the results of the more difficult questions, uh, those that required students to integrate knowledge of what they had learned uh, or with prior knowledge, indicated even greater gains for the prompted students. One explanation for these gains was that the prompted students utilized their prior knowledge to a greater degree, <clears throat> or more often. Another form of metacognition is self-regulation of motivation. Students can learn to regulate their own motivation by, for example, creating conducive conditions for study, using learning strategies that are more effective for them, studying with peers, or even rewarding themselves when they have accomplished something. Use of strategies for increasing motivation has been found to improve grades and other measures of achievement. Furthermore, when students have opportunities for self-regulation, including setting their own goals, developing study skills, and taking ownership of their own learning, they are more likely to succeed after high school. These co-cognitive skills appear to be better predictors of long-term success than academic skills alone. Makes sense? Computer-based tools can assist productive collaborative exchanges in, that support self-regulation and metacognition. One of the most documented examples originated as the computer-supported intentional learning project, now known as Knowledge Forum, which allows students to collaborate on learning activities through a communal database with text and graphics capabilities. Within this networked multimedia environment, students can engage in dialogues through their notes about topics they are studying and conversations about formulating and testing conjectures. The tools support knowledge building as a community activity. Students at the elementary, secondary, and higher education levels across all achievement levels do better on achievement tests and portfolio measures and show greater depth in their explanations than those in other classrooms. Now, this is actually interesting because I'm doing a lot of this stuff here as I'm actually reading this um, with you guys. Basically, whenever I come across something that I find particularly interesting that connects to uh, something prior in my experience or knowledge, then I talk about it. And then um, at the end of these, I try to bring maybe one or two things that I've learned. But basically what I do at that point is I explain what I've read to myself, and I don't really retain everything. But what I do retain and repeat back to myself, I actually learn a lot more uh, easily. And so it's uh, these are really good strategies. Computer-based tools can assist productive collaborative Oh, I already did that one. Did I read this one? Um, I did. I'm going to read it again, because I actually didn't space out or something when I was reading it. Computer-based tools can assist productive collaborative exchanges that support self-regulation and metacognition. One of the most documented examples originated as the computer-supported Intentional Learning Project, now known as Knowledge Forum, which allows students to collaborate on learning activities through a communal database with text and graphics capabilities. Within this networked multimedia environment, students can engage in dialogues through their notes about topics they are studying and conversations about formulating and testing conjectures. The tools support knowledge building as a community activity. Students at the elementary, secondary, and higher education levels across all achievement levels do better on achievement tests and portfolio measures and show greater depth in their explanations than those in other classrooms. Knowledge Forum 
aims to support creative work with ideas while keeping agency in the hands of the students, enabling more varied interactions among the students and between students and ideas. This, fa this facilitates self-organization at both the social and conceptual levels, along with better informed and metacognitive control of knowledge production processes that is supported by a collaborative environment which requires articulating explanations and strategies. This kind of technology can also assist the classroom teacher. Observing a group's interactions can, in, can provide a substantial amount of information about the degree to which the work is productive, as well as an opportunity for formative feedback and the provision of support for aligning in understandings and goals among group members. Thoughtful feedback and revision. Regular, well-designed feedback on students' work is a critical component of strategic learning. One of the oldest findings in psychological research is that feedback facilitates learning. While without feedback about conceptual errors or an ineffic inefficient backstroke, the learner is likely to persist in making the same mistakes. In a meta-analysis of 131 students, Kluger and Denisi reported an average effect size on learning due to feedback of 0.4. However, they also found large variation across studies. In identifying characteristics of effective feedback, the authors found that neither non-specific praise nor negative comments supported learning. Instead, gains were most likely to occur when feedback focused on features of the task and emphasized learning goals. It is insufficient for teachers merely to give feedback about whether answers are right or wrong. Instead, to facilitate learning, it is equally important that feedback be linked explicitly to clear performance standards and that students be provided with strategies for improvement. Rubrics are an important tool that allows performance to be judged in relation to well-defined criteria rather than globally or in comparison to other students, so that feedback focuses on particular qualities of a student's work and provides guidance about what to do to improve along with immediate opportunities to apply the feedback. Research has found that this approach to feedback fosters a mastery orientation on the part of the students where they seek not only to develop an understanding of the content and improve their skills, including their own learning strategies, but also come to recognize personal relevance and meaningfulness in the work itself. Furthermore, students' sense of agency and motivation are enhanced when they can strive for and demonstrate improvement. Revision of work is a critical aspect of the learning process, supporting reflection and metacognition about how to approach a particular kind of content or genre of tasks in future learning. Unless students have opportunities to incorporate the feedback as they revise their work or performance, for instance, rework math problems, retry jump shots or musical efforts, reread a tough passage, rewrite sentences, paragraphs and essays, retake tests, revamp products. They cannot benefit optimally from the feedback that teachers or their peers often take considerable time and effort to produce. A long line of research shows that expert performance is related to opportunities for deliberate practice which is coached through the provision of immediate feedback for a performance opportunities and to for a performance opportunities to evaluate and problem solve and repeated attempts to refine the behavior or skill as individuals become more expert they can self evaluate and identify strategies for improvement with less outside feedback Opportunities for regular revision also help students develop a sense of confidence and competence as they see the improvements in their work and a growth mindset that can carry into other contexts. For deliberate practice and revision to occur, feedback should occur during the learning process, not at the end when teachers on that topic is fin with, when teaching on that topic is finished. And teacher and student should have a shared understanding that the purpose of feedback is to facilitate learning. 
Given that teachers cannot frequently meet one-on-one -on -one with each student, classroom practices should allow for students to display their thinking so the teacher will be aware of it, and for students to learn to become increasingly effective critics of their own and each other's work as they use rubrics and other tools to engage in self and peer assessment. Research shows that this kind of assessment carries out during or carried out during the instructional process for the purpose of improving teaching or learning can be a powerful tool in targeting instruction so as to move learning forward. A landmark research review by Black and William found that focused efforts to use formative assessment routinely produced learning gains greater than one standard deviation which is equivalent to raising the score of an average student from the 50th to the 85th percentile. These large gains were seen when concrete, specific feedback was provided without any grade and when it was followed by opportunities to revise the work. Formative assessment is more than data gathering. It is a model for supporting learning that is designed to advance a student within his or her zone of proximal development. The assessment step in the formative assessment model, which answers the student's question, where am I now, provides the insight needed to enable effective support. The support should ideally be informed by an understanding of learning progression, which are the next steps likely to support advancement in the domain. A complete formative model which clarifies goals and provides the means to get there is synonymous with instructional scaffolding. I think unfortunately um, I, oh no, I'm going to finish this section. Mastery oriented assessment. To manage the formative feedback and learning process, teachers benefit from being able to draw on a range of assessment strategies and tools such as observations, student conferences, portfolios, performance tasks, prior knowledge assessments, rubrics, peer assessments, and student self-assessments. They can then combine rich evidence of student learning with their own deep understanding of the learning process so that they can use insights from assessment to plan and revise instruction and to provide feedback that explicitly helps students see how to improve. A mastery focused approach to assessment that emphasizes learning goals has been found to help sustain achievement directed behavior over time and to orient learners toward a focus on improving competence and deeply understanding the work they produce. In addition, assessments that place value on growth rather than on scores earned at one discrete moment uh, have been found to create higher motivation greater agency, and higher levels of cognitive engagement, as well as stronger achievement gains. In contrast, researchers have found that evaluate, evaluative comparison-oriented testing focused on judgments about students leads to students' decreased interest in school, distancing from the learning environment, and a lowered sense of self-confidence and personal efficacy. Now, there's sort of an idea floating around, and I actually haven't studied this a whole lot, but there's an idea floating around that standardized tests should be removed. But I don't think this actually talks about that specifically, and it might be sort of misrepresented to um, demonstrate that standardized, standardized tests are completely irrelevant. But I think that misses the point of what a standardized test is because a standardized test is supposed, well, when you do it or when you use it as a criteria for entrance to a particular school, it's supposed to weed out those who are not really ready yet. Like you can take the SATs, I think a bunch of times, in order to get into a particular school, you have to study for it, for it of course. Um, 
But I mean, like, who's forcing somebody to take the SATs? It's hopefully, ideally, the student himself who is wanting to study for the SATs and score high and then get into a particular school. So a lot of these standardized tests have a lot of these metacognitive uh, principles sort of built into them. And it's actually pretty important in maintaining the high level of education that you're kind of stumping for when you go to a, a really good school. But I don't know all of the literature on this uh, topic. And so apparently there is some, I guess, information floating around there talking about standardized tests in a very negative way. Now, of course, it's not really great for, uh, let's see, what did it say here? For motivating learning. It's not great for motivating learning, but I think it is a good, uh, it's not even really a great test for d demonstrating mastery. It's more a, a test of like, do you want to get in? Are you able to s study for something like an SAT or something like that? But I digress. Many schools that have been particularly successful in reducing opportunity and achievement gaps for traditionally marginalized students, producing high graduation and college success rates, have adopted mastery-oriented performance-based assessments that build higher order thinking and performance skills, collaboration and communication skills, motivation and engagement, and a host of co-cognitive skills such as self-regulation, uh, executive function, resilience, perseverance, and growth mindset. In these schools, assessments of projects, papers, portfolios, and other products are evaluated through rubrics that clearly de uh, describe dimensions of quality. When these are coupled with opportunities for feedback and revision, the assessments promote learning and mastery rather than seeking to rank students against each other. These practices are consistent with research, indicating the importance of explicitly expressing high expectations for students that are enacted through meaningful challenges, with opportunities to develop competence so that students know they are capable of strong achievement. Many of these schools require portfolios of rigorous work in each discipline that are presented before committees of teachers and outside jurors, rather like a dissertation defense. The work typically includes social science research papers, science experiments, literary essays, and mathematical models, or projects that require in-depth study, extensive writing, and oral presentation. The work may also include problem-based interdisciplinary projects, sometimes grounded in internships in the community. Research suggests that knowledge that is applied to relevant problems and situations is retained and later used at higher rates, and that students who learn modes of disciplined inquiry within, the, uh, within and across content uh, areas are better able to successfully tackle complex problems and learn on their own. Performance assessments that encourage higher order thinking, evaluation, reasoning, and deep understanding are themselves tools for learning. In addition to knowledge, the assessments built students' metacognitive and co-cognitive skills, such as planning, organizing, and other aspects of executive functioning, resilience, and perseverance in the face of challenges, and growth mindset. Performance assessments can also provide multiple entry points for diverse learners, including English language learners and students with special needs, to access content and display learning. The use of curriculum embedded assessments strengthens teaching by providing teachers with models of good curriculum and assessment practices. Enhancing curriculum equity within and across schools as all students have access to the educative tasks and allowing teachers to see and evaluate student learning in ways that can inform instructional and curriculum decisions. Such assessments can build students' capacity to assess and guide their own learning and through ownership in, in the learning process, 
strengthen their interest and motivation. Man, it's just getting good. We're actually not that far. Right there. Nope, 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 nope. Not there yet. We're probably three-fifths of the way through it so far. Where are we, right there? Something like that. Oh, I was close. Okay. So one thing that I am taking away from this so far is the whole idea of the mastery-oriented learning. You're not really learning to try to take a test and pass. And, and we all know that, like, you can study for a test, retain something in your working memory, for, I don't know, a day or so, and then just take a test and pass it, but then leave and remember nothing. This is how I am with, with Japanese, for instance. I don't remember much from Japanese class. What's more effective for actually learning, according to these papers, are, are learning these metacognitive skills that allow you to uh, better learn, uh, better think about how to think. So you can think critically, you can um, focus your attention, you can uh, make it so that you have more motivation for a particular task. And so you can become better masters of the topic that you're actually uh, studying. So if it's psychology or theology or whatever it is, the more you are able to improve your own learning, the quicker you will learn, the more effectively you will learn, and that's what I'm getting from this so far. So with that, thank you for joining me. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and talk to you later. Oh, if you have any comments or concerns, feel free to comment. Bye.